So again, welcome everybody. My name is Matt Reichert. I'm so happy that you're here. I am very pleased and honored to serve as the director of the Center for Learning at OCP. Um, I'm really grateful for my colleague, Angela Westhop Johnson, who is joining us today for this really important topic. This is a conversation, Angela, I wish somebody had hosted and made available to me when I when I was in parish ministry, because I know I definitely, um, definitely would have benefited from it. So thank you, Angela, for being here. Um, I'm going to let Angela introduce herself in just a second. Just a quick note to those of you who have registered for this and are joining us live. Unfortunately, our friend Zach Sowski is unable to join us today um, uh, because of, of some other conflict that came up. So it'll just be Angela and I today, um, but we know we'll be able to pack the hour full of, full of answers to your questions and all kinds of helpful information. Um, so Angela, uh, not to put you on the spot, but if you wouldn't mind saying hello and uh, let us know what we ought to know about you before we begin today's conversation. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. It's so great to be here. Um, we at OCP are so excited about the Center for Learning. So I'm excited to be part of this. Um, as Matt said, my name is Angela Westhoff Johnson. I am the Director of Product Development here at OCP, and that is the area of, of, of that works on the products from music editorial to engraving, who makes it look great on the page, recordings, puts out amazing, amazing recordings. Um, it Worship Publications, who works on the missile and the hymnal itself. So we um, get to really dig our teeth into the products that you use. Um, I'm also the director of music at St. Mary's Cathedral here in Portland where I have um, been for, this is my 30th year. I can't believe it. I don't wow. know how it's possible. Um, I've been here at OCP 29 years. So I've I've done those two roles. And really, if you're gonna do have a day job and a weekend job, which they, <laughs> two, you can't do it better than this. So it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, thanks, Angela. I mean, I, not only from your work for OCP, but also your work with the Archdiocese of Portland. Um, I, I know you have so much a wealth of knowledge and wisdom to share and other resources to point us towards. Um, those of you who are joining us live, um, again, I put into the chat the link to where you can find the handout for today. Those of you who are watching this recording, thanks for being here. Thanks for watching this recording. Um, you can find our handout. You can find all of the handouts from our past webinars in our resources section of our website. Um, and there's more information on our website for how you can access all of those handouts. Real quickly, before Angela, I pitch you our first question, I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. so that everyone uh, can see. This is the handout. And what, what I want to do right now is we're not going to go through line by line. I want to give you a sense of what's in this resource packet um, so you can download it. You can take a look at it later. I know some of you are joining us between meetings. Um, some of you are joining us by phone and maybe not able to open up this other link. So I wanted to give you a sense of what's here. Um, in all of our packets, we include the mission statement for the Center for Learning. Again, we're here. We exist to help pastoral leaders and decision makers like yourself to minister more confidently and effectively. So I hope you'll check out more about the Center for Learning and what we do, who we are, and the things that we offer on our website. Um, we have some rehearsal considerations here. We'll talk about some of these. You'll notice that there are four blanks at the end. So if you're the kind of person like me who likes to print something out and stick it on my wall, you can add some of the other things for your choir or your ensemble that work here. A couple of links to some other um, resources or articles or things for you to, you to check out as well. Um, I included two articles from today's Liturgy Magazine. One, the well-rehearsed choir rehearsal from you, Angela, um, and another one, Leadership for the Choral Rehearsal from Lisa Billingham. Both of these are great resources that give a lot of uh, best practices and practical resources. These are also great things for you to be able to share with other music ministry leaders, choir members, it makes a good discussion piece as you're looking at ways to provide professional development and resources to your music ministers. And to that end, we've also provided some reflection questions for that you can use with one or the other or both of these articles. So especially with your staff or your liturgy committee or your music ministry team, um, whatever that might mean. And maybe it's just you and, and maybe one, somebody else who, uh, who accompanies. You can use this to help with your own application of the wonderful uh, uh, best practices that Angela and Lisa lay out in their articles. So we have this here if it's helpful to you. 
We also have a rehearsal culture checklist. Um, as you're thinking about the way you rehearse, um, some of the best practices in the articles and the rehearsal considerations, some of the things that we'll talk about today, this is an easy way for you or again, with a group or a committee to go through and say, do we do this or don't we do this? And whether we do this or don't do this, is there something we could do to improve that? What's something we could do today? And it's a way to do some self-reflection or group reflection that can also lead to an action plan. So again, if this is helpful, download it, print it out, circulate it, use it. Again, we are trying to equip you with tools um, to use for yourself or with your music ministry team um, to, to help, help you rehearse better and build that rehearsal culture. We have so many things that we need to pay attention to um, that it, it's sometimes hard to, to see those low-hanging fruit opportunities that are right in front of us. So this is not in any way meant to be a way to, to grade yourself or to point out any blind spots, but it is a way to make sure we can see the things that sometimes are easy to fall through the cracks because we're just so busy and pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, following this, we have a, from, from a, a pastoral press resource that OCP has published in the past, a primer for Catholic choir members by uh, Larry Johnson. This is a list of choir member expectations. They're kind of funny. They're they're a little um, uh, 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 biting, maybe in their humor. Um, they're by no means meant to be something you just you know copy and take whole hog, but it gets you started. Some of these are a good list of pet peeves um, that choir directors might have that you might want to think about as you're developing your own choir member expectations. So that's there for you. And then we also have a, a, a rehearsal agenda builder. We'll talk a little bit about how to build a rehearsal agenda, why you should do that, what you should communicate, how you can keep track and evaluate a rehearsal. And so we have a blank one here. If it's useful to you, modify it, use it uh, if it's if it's helpful. Um, and then we also have an example filled in in case that's useful just to see how this might work or what this might look like. Okay, um, And then some more information about the various um, services that the Center for Learning provides. So there's a lot of stuff in that packet. Again, um, if it's useful, use it. If it's not helpful, move right past it or hand it off to somebody else. But I want you to know what's included there. Okay, that's enough of the housekeeping stuff, Angela. Let's kick off the conversation. Um, and and uh, really, this might seem overly simplistic. We're just gonna start at the very, very basic, the, the obvious. Um, I hope we all understand why rehearsing is important, right? Hopefully we, we're putting in the time to rehearse, we're putting in the time to practice. Um, why do we need to put in so much care into planning those rehearsals? Right? I mean, we have rehearsal before we have Sunday, we just run through the music for Sunday. Why do we need to put in so much care? I'm being, I'm being facetious, right? Yeah. Why do we have to put in so much care planning those rehearsals? What, what difference does it make? Yeah, it makes all the difference. And I can tell you, I, I just have to go back 30 years, which sometimes when we think about that, wow. Or how, whenever we started our, I, I walked into no program, right? Mm -hmm. It you would think a cathedral would have a program. My very first choir rehearsal had seven people. And I'm, I mean, I was young, but they were, they seemed, I know two of them passed away that year. I mean, the average age was like 70 not kidding. And I thought, I, I'm not sure I can do this. I, I mean, they were the sweetest people ever, but I decided I'm going to create a plan. And I, I had a three-year plan and I had a five-year plan and um, then worked backward. What did I need to do to get to that place? And I knew that I could not teach the music by rote like play every note for them at rehearsal. I couldn't do that. So just, just to let you know what I did in the very beginning was I would have the women come in half hour before rehearsal. And then the next week it was the men. And the next week it was the women. I didn't have four parts yet. So eventually I got to the place where it was just sopranos, yeah. just alto. So each month, one of the sections came in huge, huge deal breaker. It made them have a little more confidence going into the yeah. rehearsal. I got to better know them. So, but I had to be super prepared, like um, not only with the repertoire we were doing, but those little goals, like um, I'm just going to really work on vowels tonight. Vowels are a big thing for me because you can hear when not everybody's saying the same vowel. Yeah. 
And um, all you Midwesterners, when I moved to Oregon, people were like, where are you from? I don't think I have different vowels, but apparently <laughs> they did. They're like, you spread that vowel like you're a good old Minnesotan, but I from Iowa. Um, so yeah, they can see right through a lack of preparation, right? And so to get to those goals, I had to know exactly where I was going. So when you showed that rehearsal, I, I call it rehearsal lineup or agenda. Um, I tried to get through, I just pulled up a couple of them. 20 songs a night. And I know you're all thinking, I know you're thinking, what? And you rehearsed for six hours, right? Yeah. Two hour, two hour rehearsal. That doesn't mean you do the whole song. Yeah. That means you may do eight measures and you do that a few times and then you move on to the next piece. Um, and in fact, my first rehearsal is September 7th. I think that's the date, that Thursday night. And I like to do, um, something for all the seasons of the year at the first rehearsal. So they're getting an Advent, a Christmas, a Lenten, an Easter piece. And then um, just to get their like teeth wet. At the end of the year, I also do music for Advent. So after Easter, after confirmations, after ordinations, that kind of thing, um, I like to weave in some uh, music for the fall. Um, but yeah, you have to know your music. Yeah. And uh, you're not winging it. You didn't yeah. look at it right with them. And if ever I have to do that, because I've done that before, like you order a piece of music and it just comes in that day. And I will say, we're all reading this together, but uh, it's a disclaimer. I let them know. <laughs> <laughs> you you well, gotta no, be prepared. I, I, I love that description. And, and what I what I hear in the way that you've described, right, what you came into and some of the things that you did, you know, separating out by section or, or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. um, and, and even, you know, focusing in on certain measures, um, being able to really script out not only what you're going to cover in a rehearsal, but specifically, and we we put this in the template, um, if you're looking at the resource packet for the the agenda planner, um, specifically what? So, so we're going to rehearse Ed Eicher's Lord of All Hopefulness which is my new favorite choral piece. Me by too, the way. I love it's it. just gorgeous. So if if um, those of you who don't know that piece, go check it out. It's not the tune you think, but it's the text you think, and it's gorgeous. Right. Um, but specifically, what, if there's 87 measures in that piece, are are we rehearsing all 87? And are we rehearsing every musical consideration? What What is it we're looking at for that right. time? What I hear in, in all of that is um, not only the, the efficiency Right. Um, because we have so many things to pay attention to. And, you know, choirs, we love being together and making music. And it's easy to get lost in that moment or it's easy to um, lose track of time. Right. Yeah. To be in that state of flow. And then all of a sudden, oh, shoot, we didn't get to that section that we really needed to. Right. We we need to specify what we're getting at. And and ultimately, we we need to plan our rehearsals to make them effective, to make our music ministry and musical leadership as solid and confident as effective because it is music ministry, right? Because it is a ministry, because the the assembly that we're supporting demands it, right? And the, the, the support of the liturgy that we are helping lead at and minister to demands it. And so if, if we're just going through by the seat of our pants, Mm -hmm. This Thursday, we're rehearsing what we're going to sing in three days and that start at the top and just start and yeah. stop everything. Okay. I mean, many of us are there or have been there and sometimes we right. have rehearsals like that. But what can we do to get a little further? What can we do to refine not just our musical formation, but our liturgical formation, yeah. our prayer, um, the, the way that this choir is also a discipleship group, not just a group of people who have a reasonable amount of talent who like to sing, right? Um, so in all of those things you're talking about, Angela, I, it, I'm so grateful for that response because it brings us so much back to that foundation of what the heck what the heck we're here for. Why, you know, why here? does choir yeah. exist in the first place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to spend about five minutes on each song. Mm -hmm. Never more than that, unless it's like a Easter or something and you're really going through, but yeah. I split up my rehearsal. Sometimes it's three minutes mm -hmm. I'm doing eight measures. Let's go on to the next thing. Um, what's very, very important is to send out that rehearsal lineup. I do that on Monday, sometimes Tuesday morning and our rehearsals are on Thursday. 
and I give them the lineup. I always, you know, write a little email of some sort. I give them the lineup and the times exactly. They know when it is. And then at the end of the piece, I tell what day we're doing that in liturgy. Yeah. So they can they can look ahead, but and it's to the very you always begin on time and you always end on time, and um, I that's sort of a a thing out in Oregon when I started grad school I noticed that people would walk into class like late we never <laughs> did that never did that back home in Iowa it was like the door got locked I think and out in Oregon we noticed that sometimes singers come in late and it's like unless you've called me and said stuck in traffic the door gets closed and they can't and then we we want people to show up on time respect one another's time and um and on time so yeah. they know on early in the week what we're doing on thursday yeah, yeah I, I love that um and and in a, in a in a second we'll make sure we hit all of these um rehearsal recommendations but i i love the the encouragement to start and end on time not only just as a practical person of oh my gosh we we need this time right right um yeah. but also from the lens of you know we un, un, unless you're the outlier and maybe you are god bless you all of us would be interested in having more members in our music ministry or in our liturgical ministries more volunteers i think i think the the more we are attentive to a professional professionalized respectful culture for groups and volunteers so people know what to expect not it's not going to make it obvious or make it take care of itself but it's a little easier to onboard prospective new choir members or volunteers i know yeah. i'm going to give an hour or an hour and a half or two hours whatever it is of my time on these weeks on yeah. these dates and i can plan on it i can hang my hat on it right there's nothing that's more frustrating than i thought we'd be done at seven and at 8.15, I'm just walking out the door. Yeah. That's not a way to keep people coming back and right. happy. And your choir members are your best recruiters. It's so it's hard for yeah. them to advocate, come and sing with Angela's yeah. choir when I never know when I'm going to get out of there or when we're going to start or it doesn't feel like we yeah. do anything. Yeah. I, oh, something yeah. you just said is I had 62 at one time in the choir. Oh, my goodness. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's always a lot of work. But 62 <laughs> choir members reduces the commitment from the others yeah. because they think, oh, they don't, I don't need to go. There's 60 people there. Yeah. And so that kind of change, I wanted to hear everybody sing, some people self selected out. I think like 35 to 40 is like perfect mm -hmm. size. And that's kind of where I am now. And yeah. I love it. But yeah. Yeah. So starting on time and ending on time, like I said, is, is a real um, core component of this. Like, And when I say professional or professionalized, I am not trying to like take this out of the realm of volunteers. And yeah. I know for all of us who are musicians or in choir or have been in a choir, we know what it's like to be like a part of... To, to have that feeling of belonging and to be a part of our people and to find your community in that way. So I'm not trying to take this out of the realm of fun or anything like that, yeah. right? So when I say professionalized, please know I'm not talking about capital P, right? I'm still very much lowercase. Uh, but yeah. those are important elements to building a strong rehearsal culture, right? And so now, you know, you mentioned you walked in with seven people 30 years ago. Um, now I gather, I've not been in your rehearsals, but I gather that your rehearsals run pretty tightly, right? They do. Uh, how do you, what, what are those elements of a strong rehearsal culture? How do you, how do you build that? What, what are some of those elements of the rehearsal culture that you've really focused on? Yeah, that, that's, I love that question because you think of, I think you said culture or what the feeling of your group is. Um, you have to make it enjoyable. Like you said, it's got to be fun. R rehearsal is like my highlight of my week. <laughs> Sometimes when it's like cold and raining and icky weather out, I not so, it's like you kind of dread it. It's like going to the gym, but once you, you're there, you're like, oh, I love this. I'm so glad I, but I want everybody to want to be there. Yeah. And um, so there is an element of that social camaraderie my group is very close like I'm sure all of your choirs are we genuinely love one another mm. and that's that's a 
that's a culture that we've created over these years. But, you know, I no longer have a, a break in my rehearsal. So I want people there early. I mean, I'm, I'm there an hour to an hour and a half early. The room is perfect. The I have boxes for them to put their new music in. I always indicate what's new in their little box that night. I expect them to have their folder in order mm -hmm. because I, finding music in your folder is really hard. So it's got to be in rehearsal order. We go to the next piece. We go. Um, but that 15 minutes beforehand when people are coming in and talking, oh my gosh, it's like, I just look around the room and I think, Yes, that's yeah. it's it's really important for a choir to have that. Um, and then it, I don't take a break in the middle, but sometimes I lead them astray with a joke or something. And then I think, why did I do it? Because I just like <laughs> get them back. They're laughing and then there's side conversations. I'm like, come on, you guys. But I did it to them. So yeah. I have to you have to balance that, I think. Um, sort of telling stories. I think mm. that's a really good. There are members of my choir who have been there for 25 of the 30 years. And so when we talk about other years or in the past or other liturgies, people get to that kind of cohesive, they feel part of a of a, you know, a group that's been around a long time. Yeah. Um we move it pretty quickly, like you said, and I don't give them a lot of time for chatter until I feel like they need it. You know, mm, yeah. um, the 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 movement we were we have a incredible rehearsal space, but it's not as incredible acoustically as the cathedral is, where the you know, and so a lot of times I begin in the rehearsal space with something brand new, and we just read through it, gather your music, we go downstairs into the church, and that little five minute walk over, they're talking. Now it's time to really get to work. Yeah. And um, and and we move fast and they really seem to love that. If they're yeah. giving up, you know, people have children or activities. If they're giving up that time, I often think, would I, would I volunteer and give up my time to be there if it wasn't super efficient? Yeah. And, and so that's what you want them coming back for more. Right. Um, yeah. I don't Yeah, I don't. no, I and I think I think that last point you made is is especially important again as we 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 had a a webinar conversation earlier and again those of you who weren't able to be with us you can watch the the recording. We also have a professional learning community coming up in October dedicated to this topic and that is recruiting volunteers or or recruiting uh, more members for our groups. And and nowadays especially post pandemic, but especially if you look at generational research, um sometimes millennials and self-disclosure i'm a millennial um and gen z get a bad rap because of um sometimes the feeling can be we're a little non-committal or standoffish from getting involved mm -hmm. when really what the generational research suggests is we have every desire to find a way to get involved and give of ourselves and find belonging but we're far more choosy about it than perhaps in general previous generations have been so it will be harder to get most people, but especially of younger and younger generations involved, if this feels like, well, we're not really doing anything. Yes. We're not really getting anywhere. Um, I, If I could be doing something else with this hour that would contribute more, I would feel more fed or more belonging, I'm going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And so we... we not that we're competing with other things, but we just have to be aware of that. Um, I want to share real quickly, I'm, I'm going to go back for a second to the um, handout for those of you who've been able to download it. Um, and again, those of you watching later can find this in our resource library. A, a couple of things that we point out here in Angela, many of these things are drawn from the best practices that you outlined in your um, article that we also have in the handout. Um, a real quick way to check in some of the, the low-hanging fruit that you can begin to do for rehearsal this week or next week that can start to ratchet up that rehearsal culture. Now, warning, culture is not built in a day, right? So this is something where you have to get in the habit and the routine of something to really see, see effects. Um, are singer or instrumentalist folders prepared ahead of time? Or do we spend a lot of rehearsal time? Is rehearsal late because we're scrambling to find copies? Oh, yeah. And ooh, your folder is over here and ooh, you have the wrong copy of has to be done before the first person walks in 20 minutes early, right? Um, the rehearsal agenda, we know what we're gonna do. We know if this is exploring new music, we know if this is a real drill down into these complex, we, 
we know what the vibe of this rehearsal is going to be, right? Um, because we know what's on the agenda ahead of time, right? We, Can I we say don't... one thing about that, Matt? Please, please. The importance of when you create that rehearsal lineup or agenda, it takes me, I spend the bulk of my time with that. Mm. It would be easier to just put them in the order of, I, I use performance in quotes, just the yeah, yeah. order that you do that in liturgy, but I never do that. Yeah. I alternate based on degree of difficulty, range. If the tessitura of a piece is super high and the tenors and sopranos are singing way up there for too long, the next piece may be unison. Yeah. I'm a lover of unison choral music. L love it. So if you, if, and then I really love complicated stuff. But if you don't vary that and yes. everything is too difficult, your choir gets overwhelmed. Yes. So balance that sort of thing. Um, yeah. that's a great chairs. that's a great recommendation. And I think um in in the packet there's a link to another blog article that OCP published um just a couple of years ago, uh, looking at small parish choirs, but really mm -hmm. for for any any size choir. <clears throat> Um, and I can't remember the the author, but I know she recommends even the flow of <clears throat> starting with something that's maybe familiar, or we did this a year yep. or two ago, or the last time cycle B came through, and we're revisiting mm -hmm. it, to really drilling down, doing the heavy lifting uh, or of some more complex things to then end with something that's unison or more familiar to end on that positive momentum. The, the shape of this is really yeah. important. And those of you who are teachers, right? Those of you who are or were music teachers or classroom teachers, this is not unlike lesson planning, right? When you're thinking about the scope of a week or a particular lesson, yeah. you, you want to think about the experience of those in the choir as they're journeying through this, what can you get out of them um, along with what you need to get to in that particular rehearsal? Mm -hmm. um, that leads to, I, I'm a big fan of number 12, that not only do you want that agenda and lineup sent out ahead of time, but also it should be posted or made available in the rehearsal. Now you might not have a whiteboard or you're rehearsing in the space. Maybe people have copies of it or whatever. I found this is so helpful because when I've been in charge of choirs, and, and you all know this, I'm preaching to the choir, no pun intended, here mm -hmm. where you have, um, you, you need to listen, you need to conduct, you need to coordinate, you need to think two steps ahead, you need to keep an eye on the clock, you're managing behavior, you're keeping an eye in the room, you're, you're, you're divided in so many different ways. When the agenda is out there, and it says four minutes, this piece, yep. this task, yep. I find that others police themselves or help to police others. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily, you know, um, except for like the tenors, of course, not necessarily that people are chatting or off topic or whatever, but oftentimes it's just, if we're getting pulled, oh, that's right, this is what we need to focus on. And it's a, it's a yeah. great way to stay efficient, you know? Mm -hmm. um, this uh, number 11 is a reminder I put in because of my shortcomings, full disclosure, basic rehearsal necessities are available. There's nothing worse than we're going through something and I remind my choir to mark their scores and they say, do you have a pencil? And now uh -huh. I'm, I've lost my train of thought and I've lost 45 seconds because someone has to go to the other room to grab the box of pencils, right? They're there, they're ready to go, right? Um, we have some other things again on this topic of, of rehearsal culture. Um, rehearsals regularly, not necessarily every time, but regularly include some sort of liturgical or ministerial formation. Why did we choose this piece? Why yes. are we singing this piece or why are we singing this piece in this way or at this point in the liturgy? What is it supporting in our ritual celebration? I I should know that because I'm also going to lead that song or, or minister through my music differently when I know the purpose that it serves and it, and it adds to my own discipleship. Angela, how in your choir, how do you handle um, you know liturgical or ministerial formation or any of that kind of catechesis opportunity? Yeah, I share so much of um, that preparing the liturgy, why something is selected. We will read the one of the lessons for the next week mm -hmm. and how that ties into the song, the piece that we're doing. Um, I've often said, I think anyone in my choir could lead a choir, even those that don't mm. feel... Um, they didn't study music in school. I mean, they were a, a musician of some sort, um, but they could all leave because I bring them so much into yeah. that 
yeah, the liturgical formation. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah. And then, of course, I'm sad if they, they do. I often will say every every piece of music I hand out has a number on it. And if you aren't doing this, everybody has a number and I, we have boxes and they have their number on that. We do wear choir vestments and they have a number. So um, they uh, and then choir folders. I wish so much that OCP distributed these the black choir folder that has the little hand thing that mm -hmm. is they're phenomenal if you are a choir that holds your music up like this those are great it's an investment but ooh, and it has a number on it so their folder should be like all number 10 you shouldn't yeah. have a number 30 because you forgot your 10 i don't usually let them take music outside the, the the building just because they forget it then. And if it is someone who really wants to spend time, then I know that they will bring it back. So, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, just a couple of things that I'm seeing start to come through in some of the questions. Um, one of the, uh, one of the, the questions, um, that we were asked really has to do with like the, starting on time is great, but how do you build that momentum and not feel like you're sort of, I, I, these are my my words, yeah. uh, not not yours who asked the question, but um, how do you not feel like you're steamrolling the beginning and, you know, allowing time for people to really get to know one another? Um, I, I'd be interested to hear, you know, Angela, when, when you start a rehearsal and it starts at seven or whatever, and at seven, you start. Um, we do. How do you begin? Is this something that just over time people have been cued so they know it's seven we start? Or is there a way that you begin that kind of snaps everyone to attention? Yeah, well, I always put that in the rehearsal lineup as well. Okay. <laughs> Every week when they get their email, it does uh, some, you know, the importance of starting on time. And you have a few that have busier lives and they're always like two minutes late. But, but for me, I always think be like a brass player. Brass players are 15 to 20 minutes early, always. And they're warming up. And I begin our warm up five minutes early. Mm. So seven is when we want to get into repertoire. Five minutes till we are working on warm ups. And, and um, then I like them there 15 minutes early. That's not, that's not too early. So yeah. yes. They just yeah. get used to that. And there's nothing like walking into a full room of people singing and you're late. That is enough to do yeah. it, to help people. So yeah. I know uh, I, I love that. And I know I've seen um, both. I've had some success with this and I've seen others who have success with, you know, if seven o'clock is your start time, seven o'clock is when warm ups begin. And, you know, to your point, Angela, all of a sudden the piano starts or there's mm -hmm. some sort of singing yeah. that starts and people fall in line. And it's an easy way instead of shouting, hello, everyone tapping on. Oh, something. yeah. Could you sit down, no. please? Could you sit down, please? You just start playing start, the piano. Right. Yep. Um, also, yep. then, you know, following warm ups, our, our typical route had been warm ups just start. People know. And after those five, six minutes, however many minutes of warm up, we would go right into prayer. Um, mm -hmm. And we would pray every time. I can't stress this enough, especially for, yes. for a choir in a parish or church choir, not only because of who we are, but also to distinguish this membership in this music ensemble from other ensembles. But um, obviously we we would use that prayer to accomplish some of the other things that are on our recommended list. Like our prayer very much took on the season we were in or the season we were rehearsing for, right? Yeah. Or a prayer might begin with maybe there was a reflection for a particular celebration, we have the solemnity of Christ the King. And so maybe it's a paragraph about that or from the, the yeah. a collect or something, whatever it would be. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it was just an hour father, right? And that's great. But we would include in that moment an opportunity for intercessory prayer, um, which is a great way to bring our own particular needs, mm -hmm. the needs of those who have asked us to pray for them. It was a way to, to do our due diligence to one another by holding one another in prayer. It was also a way to formulate group cohesion, because I now knew, oh, Angela's aunt isn't well, or I now knew, oh, Dennis's wife is, you know, going in for surgery on Tuesday with, and this is going to sound crass, and I don't mean it this way, but we were able to get to know a lot about each other and pray for one another and not lose a lot of time in the small yeah. talk. Yeah. Right? That, that came during the breaks or afterwards, but the point being, and the reason I brought this up was to say, we just started with warmups. We moved right into prayer. And then 10, 15 after, or, or whenever it is we're starting, we're rehearsing. 
but also acknowledging that life happens. If someone was late, because it's going to happen, it's too bad that they miss warm ups. It's really too bad they miss prayer, but now we're down to yeah. business. And yeah. It's not a distraction. Yeah. You know, Matt, the, I don't know if you've ever talked about or you've seen OCP has resources called, it's in our pastoral press division, um, choir prayers, more choir prayers, even more choir prayers. I turned around earlier to see, again, we're just moving in and I don't have it at my fingertips, but those three books, I have three sets of those in my choir room and I pass those around and have other people lead the prayer at times just to hear other mm -hmm. voices sure. and they stand up in front of people and read them. They are exceptional. So if you aren't as comfortable leading prayer, it's a way to bring other people in and they always talk about music and, yeah. and they're really great. Yeah, no, that's a great recommendation. Um, we have a question into talking about starting rehearsals and you mentioned that, mm -hmm. you know, you begin uh, warm ups a little early. Um, uh, Warm-ups can be something that, especially for folks who maybe aren't formally trained or it's been a while yeah. or ministering in smaller places, can be kind of intimidating, right? Okay. Um, as you design the warm-ups for a particular rehearsal, talk us through how you think about it, what your warm-ups look like, what you're trying to accomplish to demystify that process for us. Yeah, um, the, it is It is like the stretch. I say this for an athlete, just hitting yeah. the running cold. It can be tough, but you stretch a little bit. Um, the the warm-up is so important. And I probably have 10 to 15 different warm-ups that we just, I might play through an arpeggio mm -hmm. they know, and they're just, they're there. Um, working on different, I mean, there's so many at, uh, books of warm-ups OCP only really has one resource that I've used as to, for warmups, but thinking about vowels, that's for me the most Im important uh, uh, change, quick change to get a choir to sound more unified and more professional. Um, but think, of, uh, you know, going through from low to high, I always start on the low end, even sopranos, tenors, gotta use the chest voice some down there. As we go up, I always say, you know, drop out if it's too high, because if, if, if it's an untrained singer, they may do some damage trying to get too high, the straining and that kind yeah. of thing. So, use different things, have them st sing staccato, have them think here, we're just really th singing legato, all the things that can then go into as you're working technical things with the choir. I often build a chord. I, I've, I've got enough people to do an eight part chord, but if you have four voice, you know, have the soprano, uh, alt, basses, tenors, maybe a major chord spread out and have them go up a half step and go up a half step. And that is staying in tune is all you have to do is this and this, and they will, they're going all the way through. One of the, the best um, uh, kind of training that I did early on, on my big whiteboard, on one side, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you should be able to start them off on one, and they should be able to sing the fifth. And they should go back down, sing the seventh, sing the, so they understand the, 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 the note pattern. So they know what a minor third should be or a major third to get them to sing one, one, two, one, one, two, three, two, one, one, two, three, and to jump around on the easy. They know the fifth, they know the third, they yeah. can sing the seventh to the eight, to the octave to, so lots of different warmups to do. And, um, you know, maha mehi mihi mohomu, always tell them what they're trying to do, you know, sing legato here, everything's staccato here, da, 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 and have your choir sing a piece of music on, um, staccato, but they're holding the length of the note, staccato, the attack, I guess on set, but how you would, so staccato singing, you have to use a whole lot more support, right? Than legato yeah. singing. So um, lots of warmups available out there. And I have a little cheat sheet we can send out if-, if Oh, that'd be want. great. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. We can add it. There's also um, reference in the handout to, I think I, I think the resource that you're referring to, Angela from OCP, uh, Christopher Walker's Sacred Rounds, um, which is a great repertoire because they're short, right? As you would expect from rounds. And so we can really internalize them. That's um, right. 
what I like about Chris Walker's resource too is that there's a good index of what what does this warm up accomplish. And so if I'm thinking later, I'm going to rehearse this piece, and I really need to work on you know this particular interval. Yep. Right in the index, it says these are the warm ups that work on this particular yep. interval or you know staccato or legato yeah. or phrasing or whatever it yeah. might be um and that's not unique to, to chris of course um uh, there if you do a simple search you can find like you mentioned angela all kinds of other resources that have yeah. that type of index mm -hmm. so. what walk do, walker does also is that he puts like the degree of difficulty yes so that's really some of those are difficult <laughs> and um but yeah my i i have those for the choir and um i also will use the psalm as the warm up, sure. Um, so I have for thirty years used respondent acclaim, and I know there is a mixed feeling of respondent acclaim that people are bored with it, or you know, it, it has done. Great. We sing all in parts a cappella for the verses, and you can work on so many. That's how we warm up on Sunday morning. Yeah. I don't rehearse hymns. I don't know about you all. Um, I'm now the leadership of, of at the cathedral. We're doing a lot more public domain hymns. Those aren't things we rehearse. Um, and they read very well, but we, you know those hymns and you know the parts of those, but the Psalm is so important that every person understands the text yeah. of the verses of the Psalm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great suggestion. Uh, John John asked about that, you know, regarding efficiency, is a conventional warm up with vocal scales, exercises, etc. good for church choirs? Or would singing through a familiar mid range or maybe even wide range song be a better use of time? You address that a little with the psalm, but anything else you'd like to add about that? Yeah, the problem with maybe singing through a hymn, if you're doing it in parts, is that they haven't warmed up the whole voice. And so it might get too high for some. And so that's why a vocal lease will help to the lower voices, all the voices you can, um, but for time's sake, sometimes we have to do that. We, we mm -hmm. punt, but to, you know, get them to really understand the importance of vocalizing. And I think a lot of it is placement and vowels. Yeah. 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 That's a great, great suggestion. And I think maybe, maybe another way, John, to think about it too, is do it. <laughs> so <laughs> it'd be great to work into warmups or whatever, if it's not the point where your choir is at and you need to sneak into it by starting the, let's use this familiar piece or this refrain as a way to serve as the warm up. do it. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I'm, I play piano fine. I would not really feel comfortable playing in liturgy, although I've had to, but um, the one thing that I decided early on, and I, I learned this through um, grad school is don't play for a choir, very little playing. There's no need to play for them. If they get to, the, it's easy to rely on the piano too much. Have them sing alone, get them started, walk away. And if they're falling apart, then you go to the piano, but maybe use like for warmups, get them started. And then they know they're just going up a half step every time and then down a half step. Boy, the ear really improves through that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, we, we have about uh, 12 minutes, 13 minutes left or so. Again, if you have a question, you can add it to the Q and a, um, uh, thanks for those of you who have had questions coming through. Um, we did have a question. Some of the other resources and things that we mentioned, we'll make sure to capture and send out to you. Um, if, if those of you on the, uh, on the call live would like to add something into the chat that you found really helpful. Um, Melinda adds, you know, all three choir prayers books are on her rehearsal cart. She uses oh. at least one of them nearly weekly. Um, that's Me a Great suggestion, Melinda. Thank you. Um, so if you have other suggestions like that, please feel free to add them into the chat and we can send out um, an additional list. Um, Angela, again, we've talked about the, the need to be prepared, to develop that agenda, to really know what it is you're, you want to rehearse and specifically what in that piece are you looking for? All of that comes back to, to you, right? As, the, as yes. the leader of that choir, being prepared yourself, knowing the music, having done that score study. So could you say something or, or, or you know, give us some guidance on how you prepare for rehearsal or what your score study looks like, you know, the kinds of things you think through as you're preparing? Yeah, 
Yeah. So my scores are, I use different colors of pencils. That's really important to me. Mm. Um, and I know what those mean. Um, my scores are marked up like crazy and I, I'm still a physical score person. Um, I can see like my kids having drawn on them years ago or my coffee stain on it. So you use the same, you know, repertoire from yeah. every couple of years or whatever. So I, I, I am indicating maybe the difficult spots. That means you've sung through or played through a piece many times. Yeah. Um, I'm not much at listening to pieces to learn them until later. And then I will mm. listen. And uh, but I, I'm afraid I might be too influenced by a performance of it, like a choral piece. If I li I want to figure out what I want to do. I'm always marking cutoffs. That's really, really important. But, um, you know, in, in grad school, I worked with a very well-known conductor, Helmut Rilling, who um, German conductor who phenomenal he didn't have a great facility of the English language. So he would say, talk less, no need to over talk in a rehearsal and let your communication, your hands be the communicator. But if you don't know when the tenors come in, how will they know when they come in? So yeah. you're cueing, you know, and at some point you will do a mass, like a mass setting and you're doing it with brass. I rarely look at a full score once I've done it a couple of times, I just mark where to cue them. Hmm. But you always have to be out of your score and communicating. If your head is down, you're never getting your choir to look at you. Why right. would they look at you? You're not looking at them. So it is knowing. Um, and, and one of the, the skills that I trained myself to do is to memorize the paper. And so much so that the page turn. I mean, I know what's happening at the top of the page. You see where a part comes in. You just learn. You have to spend a lot of time with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your pastor may not realize the amount of hours that go into preparing for an effective rehearsal. Yeah. But you, you need to spend time with your so much that I know what the next piece is when I'm ending the one piece and um, get out of your music. That That's the most important thing. Know when to cue them, you know, you might, a hymn is different. It's homophonic. Polyphonic music, however, you have parts interweaving and coming in and that's, they need to know because they, they can't always tell. So you're looking at them. Hymn singing, not as, that you doesn't need the score study the same way, right? Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you've done your score study. You've got your agenda. You communicated it. You started on time. Mm -hmm. You've stuck to the agenda. You finished on time. Um, what does your what What do you do after that rehearsal? How do you evaluate it? How do you yeah. use the experience of that rehearsal to inform the next? Yeah, I keep that line up, and it's mm -hmm. always in the the left side of my folder. Then, and that night or the next day, I'm writing down things for the next week, like where to start, what didn't go well, tenors were falling apart, picking on the tenors because actually I have phenomenal tenors <laughs> and um, they're incredible musicians. And they, I have two guys that have been in the choir a very long time. They hardly ever look at their music. I'm like, man, they, they just memorize things. Um, but make a note of what you need to work on for the next week. Yeah. And, um, I, I also twice a year send out a survey to my choir. Mm. Not like I mean, it's um, not like a monkey electronic. What are those called? Not that. But tell me what how I can improve. Tell me what you what piece did you most love? Mm -hmm. What would you like to see? Um, and overwhelmingly, you know, once we got past like the five year point. Uh, I think it was year five, we did the Bach Magnificat. And that was, maybe it was three, but I think it was five. Um, that was my kind of goal. I wanted to do a Marian program for Mother's Day. And we did. And to cover the cost of the orchestra, we sold virtual roses, if you can 
Um, and people could write in, pay money, and it was for their mother or for their aunt mm. or for some female, for sister, whomever, who influenced them. And that name was in the program. Ah, it was, it was awesome. But that was, you know, five years when you started with seven and ended with five the first year. That was not easy, but, but we did it. Um, uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Sorry, I lost <laughs> track. <laughs> but um, uh, what was your original question? Sorry. Well, just how, how, do you, how do you do that my... rehearsal evaluation or just evaluation that's in right. general? I think that survey is a really interesting. That's right. And so once we hit a point, people said, we love challenging music. Mm. They want to be challenged. But I think it's a good balance then with the beautiful... Um, oh, this is another thing that I did early on. Once we had four parts, each evening at rehearsal, it's not hard to do, right? You praise one of the sections. You praise every section at least once. And you also give them something to work on. Uh, yeah. It's like, hey, I noticed they want to feel good, but they also want to know that you care enough to make them better. Right. And so that was really important. At, and it's genuine, of course, Um but uh, you evaluate what went well, what didn't go well, so that you're not doing the same exact thing the next week. Yeah, you're improving, and a lot of it is for our own self. What what was I not? I recorded rehearsals in the beginning. Now, fun fact: we live stream every rehearsal. So if anybody ever wants to watch my rehearsal, you can do that. <laughs> um, and uh, I go back and I listen to them, and I'm like, ooh that sounded awesome. I didn't think it sounded that good. You know, that feeling. And yeah. I've said that to the choir. Um, I, I think my choir would say I'm, I'm kind of hard on them I, in a good way. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm demanding. And I think we like that uh, eventually, but I will go back then on Sunday morning and say, I listened to that. You guys sounded amazing. So um, if you give too many compliments that aren't justified they know that yes. it doesn't feel real yeah so um but yeah recording a rehearsal oh even if it's just the audio but i want to see my pattern what did i do that wasn't helpful yeah. you know if something falls apart it's you it's often the conductor if i was saying in 30 years i've had we did a dedication of a church in 1996 hardest liturgy ever planned but that was the only year that I did um had an extra rehearsal I've never called an additional rehearsal to our Thursday nights but my Sunday morning rehearsal is starts at 10 our liturgy begins at 11 so I get 45 minutes sure. and I'm going through a whole rehearsal with them not just the music for that morning yeah yeah, I know so, that. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that too. Uh, one of the things, again, participants you'll find in the um, rehearsal culture sort of checklist is also questions about what what does time look like before liturgy? Yeah. Um, because we, not only to reinforce that overall rehearsal culture, but to use it well to reground us in what we're doing, that we're not a distraction for the assembly, yeah. right, but an asset to the assembly. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of things that you you mentioned that I want to make sure to spike the ball on. Uh, Tim Smith, I know in one of our professional learning communities, also really recommends recording or live streaming uh, rehearsals for all of the reasons you mentioned. It's a good evaluation where later you say, I know I told you this. And then you go back and realize, oh, maybe I didn't. Or yes, I did. In my mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's just good for evaluation. It's good for people who might not be there. And for those of you who are rehearsing in your church space where you already have a, a live stream set up, you don't have to broadcast it to the world, right? You can do right. it so you're recording it or putting it in a private link so it's not out there because we're right. not recommending that. Yeah. Um, but but it might be available to you. It's a stretch, but but you know we encourage you to think about that. Um, we're gonna uh, do one final call for questions. We have about three more minutes. So again, if you have a question we didn't get to, Angela, I'm gonna ask you in just a second. Um, there's a lot of good stuff here. It can be overwhelming. Where do you recommend people start, right? Wherever they're at, where do you recommend they start taking that next step? Um, as you're thinking about that response, I want to, again, thank everybody for being here and remind you that the recording of this and the packet are on our website. I also, I'm putting into the chat um, 
Our upcoming program, the first session starts on Tuesday, but this is a subscription available in an ongoing basis. Um, join us for the liturgy forecast. This is a uh, set of six, again, webinars uh, throughout the liturgical year that explore everything you need to remember about a particular season before you plan. That also looks at how does that season fall this year and what are some of the other pastoral considerations we have to figure out like the fourth Sunday of Advent this year is December 24th. How are you going to get your environment folks in there after the noon mass before the four o'clock children's mass, et cetera, right? So it's a great panel. Dr. Glenn Beyer is going to be there, um, who's the uh, uh, OCP employee, but also the president of the North American Academy of Liturgy. John Kyler, Diana McAlintel, Rita Thyron from FDLC. Don't miss it. Link is in the chat. Um, Angela, last word. Where should we start? This is overwhelming, but what do you recommend? Yeah, I'm overwhelmed already thinking about two Thursdays <laughs> from now because I'm feeling a little a little less prepared than I have been. But um, sometimes if you think too big, I like to plan in the summer for the entire year. I buy choral music that I need maybe for the for the year and then put those away and think about the next just season. Let's get through ordinary time and think about Advent, Christmas, but not beyond that right now. If you're just beginning little things like I'm just going to tighten up my rehearsal, I'm going to be super prepared so that my choir is looking, going, wow, I need to be prepared as well. And maybe ask for a couple of changes, not everything. If you have late time stragglers or people who aren't as committed, I mean, I've had to say to someone who was really great doesn't seem to be working in your schedule this year. And when other people in the choir saw that, they were like, whoa, you're willing to kind of lose an amazing singer, but but you got to prioritize this. And it isn't for everyone, right? Smaller committed might be better for your group. And then people see, you know, yeah. um, and I think Matt said something with the choir, depending where your choir sits. Now, my, my choir is very visible. And I will stress the importance of that engagement in the mm. liturgy. And you know, yes, not yes, every yes, homily yes. is your favorite, but you're going to get something if you walk out. So we model good liturgy, liturgical involvement and respect for the liturgy. That's a big thing to um, ask your choir to just up that. You're not doing other things yeah. during, you know. Yeah. So little little steps, but make a couple of changes that are really noticeable for your yeah. choir. Yeah, no, that, that's a wonderful, I, I, the number of choirs I've been in or worked with or observed where it, they function as though they're still invisible in a loft, but they yeah. very much aren't, you know, the balancing the checkbooks and all the other horror stories. Um, that's yeah. a great recommendation, Angela. And I think, you know, again, for, for from my point of view, start. You know, again, we provided you with some yeah. resources. There are lots of resources out there. By no means or do we have the, the corner on the market of, of effective yeah. rehearsal resources. But try something new. Look for the low-hanging fruit. Be consistent. Know that this is going to take some time. And maybe by the second month of rehearsals, we start to yeah. internalize things. So, so give it time, but start small. Start today. Baby steps. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, go yeah, into please. the year with a goal. Yeah. What's your kind of goals yes. for this year? You know, I sometimes would say, we're going to work on this kind of genre. Yeah. I want to be able to sing an amazing spiritual with this choir yeah. at some point through the year. Go in with a goal and see where you are at the end. Yeah, no, that's yeah. a great we're recommendation. Improve, yeah, improve yeah, no, some... I mean the Technical. goal setting thing is just like now now I'm feeling unprepared for my <laughs> but but no I mean really I, I know we're we're out of time um but but let us know at the Center for Learning how we can help we have all kinds of other programmings coming up we have all kinds of other resources we have ministry coaching we have some information on goal setting coming up as well so please check us out and if we can't answer a question we are happy to point you in the direction of someone who can Angela, thank you for your time here, for what you're doing at St. Mary's, for your work with OCP um, and helping the church in the United States and the English speaking world um, pray and sing the way we do. We're, we're all indebted to you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you who joined us live. Thanks again for what you're doing in your parish community. It does make a difference. Um, whether you hear that or not, please know it does make a difference. We're so happy to have all of you with us and members of the Center for a Learning Community. And we hope we see you on another webinar soon. God bless you all. Happy Thank New you. Choir Year. <laughs> See ya. Bye-bye.